That's a difficult question, you know, when describing CIDP to someone who's never heard of it. Uh, because most patients have never heard of neuropathy, and CIDP is actually a rare form of neuropathy. So usually we start out by trying to describe the nerves, what they do normally, how they get sick, how that causes symptoms, and we talk about inflammation and a chronic disease that affects the nerves when the immune system starts attacking them, producing the symptoms patients have. It's a long conversation. We work in a field where patients have not heard of our disorders that much. People tend to know what a stroke is, they know what Parkinson's is, they know what Alzheimer's is or MS, but if you get to talking about neuropathy or myopathy, they haven't heard these terms, so they don't know what they are. So when you're talking about the broad field and then you're talking about one little segment of it or you know a, a segment that affects a few patients, it, it's a long stretch. There's a lot of education that goes into it. Um, our society needs to know more about polyneuropathy because as I said, it's one of the most common neurological disorders and we need to be aware of it, uh, how it affects patients, how it interferes with quality of life, with mobility, social activities, and then we need to know about the treatable forms. And the good thing about CIDP is that it's a treatable neuropathy. So I tend to like talking about it more than not because there's so many that we can't treat at all. Well, what they get early on is they get weak, and they may feel tired, but they get weak in their muscles. They have difficulty walking or climbing stairs. They have weakness in their shoulders and their arms. They get out of the blue, they're weak. They can't do things they did before, whether it's running and jogging, they can't do that anymore. Patients also get numbness and tingling. It's not unusual for them to get that. So those are the symptoms that come early. I think we need to educate our physicians more about neuropathies and treatable neuropathies because if you have a treatable disorder, it's um, a huge pity and not appropriate not to make the diagnosis and offer treatment to patients. There are many conditions that we cannot treat. But if we have a treatable one, we should make every effort to discover it, to diagnose it, and to then treat the patients properly. I would treat children and adults the same for CIDP at this time. My first treatment is intravenous immunoglobulin, IVIG. Immunoglobulins, we know, um, tend to uh, reduce uh, the disability and improved function in patients with CIDP, whether they're children or older people. So I would turn first to intravenous immunoglobulin, and then I might transition to subcutaneous immunoglobulin, particularly in the adults. The most common treatments for CIDP include intravenous immunoglobulin, subcutaneous immunoglobulin, PLEX, also known as plasma exchange or plasmapheresis, and the use of steroids. Some patients respond well to other immunosuppressant drugs, but further research is needed on those. It is very important for CIDP to diagnose the patients early and to treat them as soon as possible. This is because if CIDP goes on untreated, you lose nerve fibers. We call it loss of axons. The axons are nerve fibers. And as you lose those, you lose function from those fibers and you can't bring them back. So it's important to prevent that loss. And you can prevent that loss by treating patients early. And in order to do that, you have to diagnose them early. So the recovery from a relapse of CIDP depends very much on how severe the relapse was. Some patients are going to have to be hospitalized. They won't be able to walk. They will lose all mobility. Others have milder relapses where they don't have to be admitted, but they um, have lost some of their abilities. 
Usually what we do is after we give IVIG, we see a recovery that occurs over, depends on the severity of the attack, but it can be days or weeks, and some, in some cases it could be longer. For patients in recovery from CIDP, I think the supports that we should offer include physiotherapy. I think depending on the level of disability, they may need occupational therapy as well. Again, I think psychotherapy or psychological counseling or support systems are very important. I also think it's important to have patients in touch with the GBS CIDP patient organization because the patient support groups can provide supports that other people and institutions can't. Patients with CIDP are often left with residual problems. It's very rare that they recover fully to normal. If they're treated early, perhaps that may happen, but most, in most cases, the diagnosis and treatment are delayed. So a lot of patients have ongoing mild degrees of weakness or they have some sensory loss or impaired sensation and they get fatigued, they get tired, they don't have as much energy as other people would or as they did before they got their disorder. For someone who was just diagnosed with CIDP or whose family member, such as the child, was just diagnosed with CIDP, my advice would be to reach out to the patient organization and get the support and the network you need to help you, but also to ensure that you're treated by an expert neuromuscular physician, someone who has knowledge of the disorder, knowledge of what can happen to you, and will provide the care that you need. So one of uh, the most memorable cases that I've dealt with is someone that I've followed for about 30 years. <laughs> and this patient has responded very well to treatment. This person was the man who enjoyed sports and had to stop playing hockey, stop running, stop jogging, um, who was disabled. This man has been working full time, has been playing sports, and has been living his regular life in a very happy state. 